hard to move to to get the for, for example dry goods that you need for bottling or things like that it was quite complicated it was all all the the main highway full of trucks that didn't mm. want the other trucks right. to move so it was like <laughs> yeah <it> was awful <laughs> but yeah. now it's it, it's okay they they get to an to an agreement with the government so now everything is calm yeah. so soon we will start seeing the the vineyards get greener and oh. and then start to to get nervous <laughs> yeah another harvest wow. and, <laughs> yeah. and jorge where, where are you in the country uh well right now i'm actually in a place called pichilemu uh it's actually very close it's about a 15, 20 minute drive to Paredones uh, from where the grapes are coming from. So I'm uh, only a couple of feet away from the ocean right now, actually. Um, nice. I, I just I just moved here uh, trying to run away from all the COVID-19 uh, cows uh, in Santa Cruz mm. where I was before. So I'm a little better now. <laughs> mm. uh, that's, you, a very, I, that's a cool uh, place. Where the surfers yeah. go and, and all that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Are you surfing, uh, Jorge, at the moment? Oh, yeah, pretty much every single day now. Cool. Nice. So, yeah, it's a beautiful day today, actually. Uh, we've been having a beautiful week. Uh, we had some rain last uh, week, but uh, now it's, it's sunny and it's been nice. Actually, a little bit uh, of an odd winter uh, with some good amount of rain, but uh, a lot of sunny days. So we'll see how the season comes. Excellent. Okay, cool. Well, listen, guys, we'll, we'll kick off there properly. We're on Facebook now, I see. So um, welcome to everyone joining tonight, Angel on Zoom and on, on Facebook. Uh, I'm delighted to be with um, one of the original Naked winemakers, uh, Connie Schwarder, um, who's with us since pretty much day one um, and uh, making some amazing wines for us down the years. And then one of our latest new recruits, Jorge Gutierrez. Um, so it's a, a Chilean uh, hour and uh, really looking forward to hearing fr from you both. Um, I'm, I'm in good company here. I've got uh, both of Connie and uh, Jorge's Hi. wines as Pinot, Jorge's Pinot and Connie's uh, Carmen Air. Um, so I'm looking forward to tasting these with you I know no one will have your um, your Pinot Jorge, but maybe a few angels will have Connie's Carmenere or maybe another one of Connie's wines. So can't wait to, to hear about those. And um, yeah, really, um, Connie was one of our original winemakers with us from from, from day one um, with her, her Kimba label. Um, and Jorge met him on a wine trip to Chile. Uh, might even be almost two years ago, Jorge. Um, it was, and I think Connie was there as well. It was our last day before going to the airport in a hotel lobby in Santiago. Uh, Jorge uh, turned up with a few bottles and tasted them and heard the story. And uh, we were blown away by the quality of the wine. So very excited that the, the, the wine is almost uh, within reach for, for our customers now. So Jorge, I'll, I'll start off by asking, and I'm sorry, before I start that, uh, let us know what you're drinking, angels, in the comments, and where, you're, where where you are at the moment. And if you've got any questions for Jorge or Connie, use the Q and A function or uh, put in a comment on Facebook, and we'll get those questions across. Um, so, Jorge, I'll start by asking, um, how is the underpants business at the moment? <laughs> well, it's actually struggling right now. Uh, as you know, uh, things have been complicated for the all the retail business. So uh, I think I, I, I'm spending much more time in wine right now. <laughs> uh, so all, all my energy is going into wine. Uh, I think maybe 20% of my time goes to the other businesses. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm a wine guy. So I, I try to stay in the wine as much as I can. So but yeah, the other part is not doing that good pretty much here and the rest of the world. <laughs> but, well, uh, but when I, I met you, positive. yeah, when I met you, I think you said 50% of your time was working for your your mom's underpants business. So uh, 20%, down to 20%, that must be a good thing. Yeah, yeah, no, now I think it's less. Uh, so I've been I've been trying to focus more on wine, of course, is what I, you know, love and the passion that I have. So 
uh, yeah, it, it's it's been a, a good year so far. Uh, I have a couple of different uh, things going on, and I'm very happy and very looking forward to to the next uh, vintage. Mm. I think it's going to be great. Very good. And could you tell us a bit about your your winemaking career before you decided to go independent? Uh, yeah. Well, I, I worked for about ten years uh, in a in a in a big winery, uh, Montes Winery. Montes. Okay. Uh, and before that, I, I did a, a harvest at Artesa Winery in Napa. Yeah. Uh, so so I've been in the industry for about twelve years. Uh, you know, it's, it's it was a big move to to change, uh, but also I think I was very lucky to have the experience that I have at Montes Winery. Uh, I was lucky to be in different areas. Uh, I worked four years in California. I was in, in full charge of a project over there, uh, so I had the chance to travel around, uh, meet different winemakers, uh, styles. Uh, I traveled all across the the wine regions in the U.S. Uh, I also got the chance to work in Argentina two years, and then I came back to Chile and I worked for about uh, three, four more years here in Chile doing different things. And so, um, so yeah, it, it was very fun. Uh, but at some point, as you know, uh, part of my story, uh, I had that will of, uh, of the independence, right? So, uh, so I, I took uh, one step forward and started doing my own thing. Hmm. Very good. And, and Connie, how about you? What was your career before becoming an independent winemaker? Uh, I worked 10 years in a, in a medium to big uh, winery in Chile. And of course, I, I went to for harvest. I, I went also to Kunawara in Australia. Hmm. And all, already working in Chile, I had the uh, uh, I was very lucky to meet people from Burgundy and, and go to Burgundy to, to do a couple of harvest there. Mm. So that was really interesting. And 10 years in Chile, and then I started uh, a business with another partner, and now I'm in a new business working with my sister. Mm. And for 10 years with Naked Wise. Wow. And, and how did you meet? <laughs> how did you meet Naked or, or Rowan in the first place? Actually, it was because um, uh, before before Naked Wines, Robin was was in, in charge. He started Virgin Wines. So the company I was working was selling the brand I, I made to Virgin Wines. So when when Rowan started Naked Wines, he he knew these wines. So so he contacted me to start working directly for Naked Wines. Okay. And I think one one year later we started, yeah. Hmm. So it was, um, it was great. And was that a risk for you, kind of leaving an established job to go work for work with an unknown company at the time? Yeah, I think it's always uh, a risk, but um, it's challenging, and and it's I think you have more satisfaction when you make your own project. It's difficult, but it's it's satisfaction hundred percent more than hmm. than working for a big winery. I think for me. Hmm. Yeah. And how did Rowan describe Naked, and what what made you attracted to the the opportunity? Uh, I think what well, was a great project, a, a great a great uh, idea, a great commitment, and and from the beginning was. Uh, everything about people, about uh, knowing each other, about being, about trust, trust in, in other people, trust in business. So it was, was great. Hmm. And how did but the, I, uh, go on. Ah, uh, sorry, I, I, I didn't uh, leave the, the company where I was working to start only with Naked Wise. That, that was over already. So, so it was like a big opportunity for me. I was starting with my own business, so Rowan arrived in the in the exact moment. Right time, yeah, yeah. very good. And, and how did this label, the Kimbao uh, name and label come about? <laughs> that That's a funny story. Because um, 
I had three three dogs. So we started with Robin talking what what is going to be the brand of, of your I don't know, I have uh, three dogs, maybe it could be nice to have the name of, of one of the dogs. And and I I I loved one that was my favorite dog that was uh, Lascar, but and it's also a, a volcano in Chile, but that name was uh, was used already or was registered in, in UK. So we, we couldn't use it. So then I say, okay, mm -hmm. Rowan, I, ha I have two more dogs. I have Simbao and Kila. And he answered back the email and say, okay, let's call it Kimbao. And I say, okay, maybe it's an interesting part of marketing. Uh, blend maybe sounds better, but actually it was only like a misunderstanding that the name of the dog was Simbao and Rowan answered Kimbao. So yeah. that's so the random. brand Kimbao. <laughs> Wow. But but was my dog. So it's the name of the dog. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> That's cool. Um and uh Jorge, this this wine um which is made mainly in uh, Paradones, um, which was a region you described to us well, which I got very excited about. It's a Pinot Noir um from Paradones. Could could you tell us first about like Pinot Noir as a grape? um like why you like that wine and then secondly what why did you go to this place to make this wine uh well i, I always um I, I think pinot noir came to me in, in california uh, i had the chance to uh, make some pinot from uh, santa rita hills so i i got in love with the variety um i think it's it's, it's a variety that maybe 12 years ago um uh, it was planted in Chile, but I don't think you got uh, that many Pinot Noir wines coming from Chile at that point. But I, I think outside, it's definitely a variety that you can see much more. And, and you have all these people that they follow the Pinot Noir. They know so much about it and they talk about it. And sometimes it's the only thing they drink. So I started getting to knowing the variety more in California. And then when I came back to Chile in 2012, uh, I got the chance to um, um, working for Montes, uh, uh, I was in charge of a project called Outer Limits, and that project has the the the, the reason of uh, you know looking for different vineyards in different places, trying to find different wines. So I got the chance to travel all around Chile and and try different wines, and and I had my idea to make a Pinot Noir. So uh, that's how I actually discovered uh, Paredones. There was only a few vineyards there. Uh, so I got interested right away. Uh, one, because uh, it was in Colchagua. Uh, in Colchagua, it's very well known for, for, for reds, uh, more big reds. Uh, but Paredones is, a, is part of the Colchagua coast uh, region. So it's uh, on the other side of the coastal range. So about uh, seven to eight kilometers on a straight line to the ocean. So it does receive all the ocean influence. So um, I, I thought that it was a, a cool spot to try uh, something different uh, coming from Coltawa. And uh, I knew uh, a couple of people trying to make wine from there and, and, and I tried those wines. I liked them a lot and, and that's how everything started. And um, uh, when I, I, I got independent and started making my own wines, uh, I knew uh, some of these vineyards. So, I immediately went there and I started talking to the growers and I, I knew this this very nice grower and uh, uh, so we ended up having a relationship and, and you know working together and, and I have my little spot there and I've been working with two or three different clones now and just trying to investigate the region more. I'm actually making some other wines from there, uh, but it's a very special place. Uh, Actually, you can find very old vines, maybe not Pinot Noir, but it's a place that has a lot of tradition and uh, maybe not everybody knows about that, but you can find some 120 years old vines in some areas. Uh, and and it's, a, it's, a, it's a fresh spot, you know, it gets all the ocean influence, um, granitic soil, so it's, it's interesting. I, I think uh, you, you can find quartz. And, uh, and for me, I, I think it represents um, a style, an area, uh, and it's uh, something specific in Chile. That's why it caught my attention so much. Hmm. And could you describe the wine? So, uh, just so everyone knows, this this wine. So this is Jorge's first wine for Naked. It's it's a Pinot Noir. Um, 
it'll be arriving uh, early next year so it'll be going on a boat soon uh, over to the uk um and could you just describe the wine and maybe tell us what we could expect from it yeah so so first the, the wine's gonna be uh into the container in like three days so i'm very excited about that um so, uh, so, so for me, well, first I'm looking for the variety. I, I think uh, I'm trying to find that Pinot Noir fruit, uh, that earthiness and, and the, the fresh fruit on front. Then um, I think in terms of Paredones, uh, you, you will get all that Pinot Noir variety fruit, but at the same time, I think uh, there, so, there is some structure on the wine that is coming from the, from the terroir. Uh, so, so you will uh, find a like, good mouthfeel, uh, some, uh, small little bit of tannins as well so i think that goes very well because i, I think the wine is going to be very good with food at the same time has good acidity it's fresh uh you can find that kind of like raspberry uh, earthiness uh it has a little bit of oak coming from the aging uh the wine has been about uh 12 13 months in, in french oak barrels uh, but the idea is that uh, the, the, the amount of oak is not too much, so it doesn't cover the fruit. Uh, it's more about adding something else to the wine and, and uh, also working the mouthfeel to, to get a softer wine. And uh, I think that, that, that's what I've been looking for. So and I'm happy. I, I'm happy with the quality and, and, and what uh, ended up being. Hmm. Yeah, I think it's it's really delicious and it's really great. This is my first time trying it tonight since I met you two years ago in that hotel lobby. So <laughs> I'm really pleased to see the the end result. It's it's beautiful wine. Um, Connie, cool. to tell us to tell us, you know, like Jorge, you're an independent winemaker. What's that like in Chile? Because I think you know the image of Chile, certainly you know abroad, say in the UK, is you know, quite often for you know cheaper wines or you know branded wines. What, what's it like? You know, first off, wh why is that image there? Do you think? Um, and and secondly, well, you know, what's it like being an independent winemaker and not being part of that that that, that game? Yeah, I I, I think. Um for our country because of of the weather the climate we are very lucky we have a really nice weather with dry autumn uh, it is is easy for us make uh, nice wines and we can have like a bigger production sometimes and with very nice quality um, in other countries it's more ris risky like I, I think when, when you leave a little bit more crops, um, the, the hand, how do you say, the hand labor um, was cheaper in Chile also. I think now it's starting to change. Uh, nice wines uh, were lower and, and Chile without having all the, the tradition of the, the old world, I think was kind of of push by the market to low down the prices. So I think in the, in the, I don't know, 80, 19, beginning of 2000, and still now, um, there's, there's big companies producing relative uh, good wines, good quality wines at very low prices. They don't have big margins, so, they have to produce a lot to to gain money and that's the difficult part when when you are smaller because oh. of course we we you will not have that volume you you try to get these really nice grapes that are not uh not cheap actually they are expensive grapes in chile like in these areas um paredones you you cannot have big crops uh, in the south of Chile also, or where you have these old vines, you will have little crops and you have to pay more. I think we also, when we are small, we are more, we have more uh, con conscious about uh, the, the price of the things, about the difficult that is to produce. So we, we always try to, to pay what is uh, correct. Um, so I think there are two worlds that are so, so different. 
uh, for us is more expensive to produce. We, we don't compete by, by volume of wines. Um, they they are, are, are not uh, good facilities also like to give you service, uh, good service when you are small. So you have to be fighting all the time for everything. You, you cannot have bottles at the good price because you're more small. Nobody is going to give you better prices for, for nothing. Uh, you don't have credit. So <laughs> everything has to come from, from your pocket. So I think it's everything is more challenging when you are small. Um, uh, and it's also difficult to export when, when you show your prices because they say why Chile has uh, low prices and, and you're trying to offer a wine that is much more expensive. And then you have to explain all these. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, big companies can can make um, really uh, big volumes that of wine. They're not bad wines, but they're not interesting. They don't have character. They don't have soul. It's like a, it's like an industry, an industry like Coca Cola of making wines. And I have to say that, yeah, the wines are not bad. Absolutely not. But there are wines without soul, without character, that they're not showing really the, the potential that we have in Chile. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you there. And for, from my trip there, having you know spent a week to 10 days with you, Connie, and then meeting Jorge and Edgar Carter down south and Luca Hodgkinson, yeah, you just see a, a, another side to Chile, which is you know so hard to, to kind of see from the, from the surface. Um, and yeah, we're, we're doing what we can at Naked to really bring those wines with with character and authenticity to to, to the forefront because um, that that tells the story of Chile. That tells you know the growers and the regions and everything that makes it unique and special because it is a, such a special place. So uh, very thankful for, for for people like you to to help us um, you know to tell that story. Um, Jorge, so talking yeah. of small volumes, what is the story behind these uh, the labels and um, tell us why you've uh, designed them this way? Ah, uh, well, uh, that's pretty much how everything started. Uh, so I've been I've been selling uh, some of my very small production wines and I sign all the bottles myself. And um, as, as you remember, when we met in Santiago uh, and I show you one of those and I actually I, I wanted to show it to you because I have that same one here today uh, it's the same oh. harvest it's that pinot noir that you you try the first time so i still sell some bottles like this so that's uh why uh that, that that's where it's coming from um so i start making one barrel two barrels three barrels and 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 i i hand sign each of the bottles and uh with my own brand my own name and and i start selling my wines and small clubs and a mailing list uh, with friends and start growing and growing little by little and and, and that's how I, I've been doing it for some time now so and and you know I, I think it's related with uh, what Connie was saying I totally agree with her about how it feels to be small I think you have to do everything by yourself you have to also learn step by step how things need to be done because when you're in charge of a big, big winery that you have a lot of people behind you you can just ask for something and it's gonna get done mm -hmm. but when you're doing everything yourself uh you have to put your hands dirty right you have to uh, just jump into your truck and go to the place you need to be and move boxes barrels wine and uh for me uh, mm -hmm. uh putting my name or putting the brand on each bottle by hand I think it was part of that to be part of the whole process and then selling the wine as well uh, is to, I don't know, it kind of makes you feel very small, but it also makes you feel very alive. So I think that's kind of what, what I was feeling at the moment. And I, I still feel it, you know, like I think it's a different sensation and that's the story behind the, the label. Hmm. That's very, very cool. That's great. Thanks for sharing that. Um, and then Connie, um, if anyone's, drinking the Kimba Carwinner, like me. Um, tell us about, good, <laughs> cheers. Um, tell us about the uh, Carwinner grape, first of all. Uh, I think, I don't think I've, I've drunk it anywhere else, but but Chile, is it exclusive to Chile? Can you find it anywhere else? What, why is it special? Yeah, it's a special, it's a French 
uh, variety that in this moment, it's mainly planted in Chile. There are a couple of other countries. I think there's a little bit in Italy, uh, even in Argentina, a little bit in, in United States, I've seen. But it's mainly planted in Chile. It's a, it's a variety that came confused to, to Chile uh, with Merlot. So in the middle of the 19th century, when, when the, like the first uh, family that, that wanted to plant vineyards in Chile brought the, um, the vines and French winemakers from France, they bring the traditional varieties, uh, uh, mainly from Bordeaux. So we had uh, Carmener, Merlot, Sauvignon Blanc, uh, we also had Chardonnay, and everything was planted in the central part of Chile, surrounding Santiago, the capital. Oh. And, and then only in the year 1994, a French ampelographer came to Chile and was visiting one of the main wineries in Chile. And the the viticulturist was showing the vineyard of Merlot, and this guy said, but that's not Merlot. And the people were like, it's not Merlot, and then what is it? It's Carmener. And what is Carmener? Nobody had heard um, ever about Carmener. So then it began all this uh, like searching and, and planting separated the Carmener from the Merlot. And I, I believe uh, or we believe that that's why uh, the Merlot from Chile was like special from for consumers of Chile was like the Chilean Merlot because it was darker and, and softer and richer because it was blended with Carmener. Okay. So so then it started to to separate and and realize that it was a grape that needed time to get ripe. So long autumns. Um, perfect dry autumns. It gets ripe after Cabernet Sauvignon or Cabernet Franc. And then the winemakers started and viticulture is talking about why this uh, should not be a variety that could represent our country. What happened is also then in France was almost um, all the plants were killed by the phylloxera that was brought. It's an insect that came with plants from America to Europe. And it's a bug that attacks the roots. So uh, almost all Carmen was killed. And maybe because it's so difficult to, to get it correctly ripe, because if not really ripe, you get these uh, hard piracine notes that sometimes are not really um, nice. Uh, so when you get it riper, it's nice uh, flavors, pe pepper or bell pepper, but in in the right way, like more baked. So maybe uh, in in France they didn't want to graft it again or plant it again. I think maybe it was not really suitable for their rainy climate. And and here we really tried to to make it our like a uh, flag uh, variety. Uh, it's not easy because it's not real um, sometimes a, a variety that we all feel it's really complex but when when you get it in the good place and and you work well with the vinification and the harvest you can get really nice wines really nice wines it's, it's not easy when you want to produce a lot of volume and that maybe you will not get it right but when you do it correct it's a really nice wine. Hmm. Okay. And so for anyone drinking it tonight, uh, Carmenere, how would you <laughs> describe question. it? What does it smell like? What does it taste like? It's a, when you get it right, and of course it depends where it was planted and, and everything, but normally it, it's a blend of black fruits and spices. Uh, so you could get like a, uh, blackberries, uh, blueberries. Um, I always feel, in, especially in, in, in this one, I feel like a black and white pepper. Okay. And, and also some like, uh, even like strawberries. It's like a red fruit, really fresh. Okay. 
It has also some, like some tobacco leaf, like uh, give like a little bit more more complexity, but mm. it's not green. It's not like bell pepper or pyrazines, like really green notes. Yeah, yeah. That's because it's coming from a, from a valley, Colchagua. You know, Colchagua, Jorge. That it's uh, mm -hmm. uh, very warm, and the autumns are very dry, and you can really leave uh, the grape to get ripe. And you also have to manage the the canopy, re remove leaves, also not leave too much grape to get this this ripeness. And Rob, one of the customers in the comments has noticed uh, he's, he's detecting a bit of chocolate on, on the palate. Would you, would you agree with that? Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Has some chocolate, some, like I say, like a cedar. cedar. Well done, Rob. Nailed it. Yeah. <laughs> and in, in, in the mouth, it's really nice. It has a, a nice uh, volume and Carmener uh, is soft in tannins, so it's a wine that really people like it. Chileans, okay. the normal consumer in Chile loves Carmener. It's amazing. Really? Yeah, they will always ask you because I offer sometimes other wines, but but do you have Carmener? Because I like Carmener, <laughs> like people love Carmener. <laughs> like, <laughs> And Connie, what would, what would be your favorite wine across your range, uh, the Kimbao range or the, the, the Connie range uh, with Naked? Ah, it's, um, it's a wine that um, arrived like uh, not too much time ago. I think now it's starting to be sell. It's, uh, it's the Carignan. I, I really love the Carignan, yeah. the, the story about Carignan, what is behind the old vines and the complexity, the complexity mm. of of Carignan that uh, it's not a, a wine that is so so easy like Carmener. It's more um, challenging. Not everybody like it. It's more uh, has higher acidity, but it's more complex. And and the story behind the wine is is so nice. Hmm. That, that's my and favorite. Carignan. Maybe people would know it. Maybe more from like we're with Katie Jones. Um, Last night, yes. her husband Jean Marc and Corbier, you know, big down in the Languedoc Carignan. How did Carignan get to get to Chile? I think Carignan in Chile it's um, it's like kind of, of bigger than in Languedoc. It's for me it's more similar to Priorat in in the south of Spain. Yeah, uh, I I love Languedoc wines, and and actually Katie uh, Katie wines are one of my favorites. Um, but I think uh, it's a little bit smoother, the, the Carignan in Languedoc. I'm not sure if it's exactly like uh, the same um, clones or it developed a little bit different here. Hmm. But I, I feel our Carignan have like more, more structure. Okay. Yeah, very nice. Um, Jorge, I've got a, call, a question here from Alistair Russell. Um, what style of Pinot Noir is closest to, to your one? So would it be New Zealand style or Burgundy is what he's wondering. Uh, I think it's a little more close to New Zealand. Um, yeah, I think New Zealand. Um, I think California also, depending on from where, uh, hmm. I think there's some uh, similarities to maybe kind of like Santa Rita Hills or Sonoma Coast maybe. Uh, I, I think it has some similarities to, to Paredones or Colchagua Coast from where the grapes are coming from. So, you know, because it's a place where you don't get, you don't get that much rain. Uh, I mean, you have a, a big difference between uh, the minimum temperatures and the max temperatures during the, during the year. Uh, so I think because of the terroir and how the grapes grow, I think I, I, I would think that it's more close to those areas. And, and also what I kind of like what I'm, I'm looking for, you know, like in terms of fermentation and aging and, and potential as well. Um, in this case, uh, I'm trying to, to, to also make a wine that we can drink today or maybe in three, four years. Um, I, I'm, I'm not trying to, in this case, make a Pinot to say for 25 years or 20 years in this case. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Uh, having drunk a lot of Californian Pinots this year, I think it's, it's very close to that. So it's very ripe and it's got a lovely richness to it as well. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's, it's, it's great. 
great for anyone trying Pinot for the first time, or if you love Pinot, you know, in general, it's just a, a new style to, to, to try. It's great. And Tina asks Jorge, um, is that a little rosé in the corner of the screen? What do you got uh, there? <laughs> no, I just put it, I just put it here. Uh, I don't know. But yeah, it, it is a rosé that I make. Yeah, it, it's right here. Uh, it, it was part of the story about, you know, me uh hang right in all the all the all the bottles on uh, um i just wanted to show it to you actually so that's why i put i, I put the the rosé right there just just to have a little pink uh in the room <laughs> yeah fair. and you know in terms of the future if the pinot noir goes well you know what other wines do you think you could you'd like to make for for naked if we were if the customers were interested uh, well, today I've been uh, well. I, I've been making a lot of rosé. I, I really enjoy making it. I, I think it's uh, it's something that uh, the first couple of years I, I did different trials and things that I I, I enjoy. And, and I, I think at, at this point I kind of got to to a style that I love, and I'm, I'm making the same thing now every year. Um, now other varieties that I love. Well, for example, I love Cabernet Sauvignon. I mean, it's always been kind of like my two my two things like Cabernet and Pinot. So mm -hmm. I, I always been making a lot of Cab and I enjoy making Cabernet and I've been learning a lot last couple of years as well. Uh, maybe, you know, like playing with a little bit of Petit Verdot or Carmenere or even Syrah. Um, I think it's, it's, a, it's a fun Cabernet. And then some other uh, cool varieties. I enjoy Sanso. Uh, I enjoy Pais from Chile as well. I think uh, there's a lot there. Uh, I'm, I'm making a Pais from Paredones that's from very old vines. That it, it's, uh, it's, it's a good wine, I think. Uh, it really represents a spot, a, a style in Chile. Uh, but yeah, um, I enjoy actually like Carignan, but I never made Carignan, only a long time ago. But I, I like to drink it, so. <laughs> We'll see. <laughs> You're like me, Jorge. I, I enjoy Carignan, but I, I can safely confirm I, I've never made it. Like, <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I like to I like to drive around, and sometimes uh, I, I make small vinifications of something else, and just to try it and, and see how it works. And um, I mean, I'm always driving around between vineyards and the ocean, and trying to find some waves. And sometimes when you see a little spot that you know it's an old vine vineyard. Uh, Sometimes I like to try it. Uh, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but I like that part of the winemaking. Oh, cool. So you're, you're out looking for waves when you're surfing and you see a, a small vineyard and you think it might be yeah, that, to work that, with. That's it. That's the idea. Yeah. That's why I like to stay close to the, close to the shore. <laughs> Very cool. <laughs> It's so unique anyway. Uh, and Connie, speaking of new wines and projects, I have to ask you about the Albarino vineyard, which you planted Ooh. a couple of years back. Yeah, that has been challenging because actually it's um, we do a grafting over old Pais vines. Mm. So last year I got the the first kilos. So this year, this year, 2020. So we only vinify like 150 kilograms. So I have two kegs with the Albarino. <laughs> That's not much, is it? <laughs> uh, I think the first results uh, are, are amazing. I think it has a, a great character. And, and even I could thought that that place was going to be warm. The, the numbers, the acidity, the alcohol, uh, it's great. 12 alcohol, wow. uh, pH 3, and, and it's ripe. It, it's fantastic. But it's going it's going to take time. It's going to take time. Mm. I I made 2,000 plants, a little bit more than 2,000 plants that have been uh, two years in um, in the nursery. <laughs> mm. <laughs> um, because I was going to plant last year those plants, but um, it was a, a challenging spring with lots of um, I would say um, heladas. ¿Cómo se dice Jorge? Heladas. Uh, frost. 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 With lots of frost so it was good that i i didn't plant them so i'm going to plant them this year and i'm going to go step by step develop this this and we're going to graft uh, another vineyard that is in the area where the carignans are planted but facing more to the to the ocean with the oh. cool 
cold breeze coming to the ocean. So I think it's going to be a very nice place. But it's going to take time. But yeah. I I am going to have more bottles for next year, but it's going to be really uh, low number of them. I don't want to make you too jealous, but we were drinking this with Carlos um, in the oh. last session. <laughs> so I think this is one of the, Carlos the Rodriguez. Regions. Yeah, yeah. For if, if angels don't know about the story, um, I think uh, Connie was telling us the mm. one of her favorite wines on tasting tour is uh, Carlos's Alvarino. Alvarino, and she, yeah. She, she she got the idea that maybe you know no one plants, no one grows Alvarino in Chile, and why not? Um, so we asked our angels, we put out to a vote. Would they get? Would they back Connie? if um, she planted Chile's very first Alvarino vin vineyard. And uh, the majority said, yes, absolutely, we'll get behind Connie. And uh, that was two yeah. years ago now. And um, yeah, 150 kilos the, the, the first year of the yeah, harvest. And we're, yeah. we're up for the wait because um, I think we're, we're behind you and you know anyone trying new things and different things and just pushing the- Yeah, it's a- uh, it, It's, it's a- yeah, it's a long story because you you can't buy plants in Chile. There there are no uh, Alvarino plants in Chile, so there's only one winemaker that brought uh, some plants. Um, but you have to wait for for years for the quarantine and all that. But I have a good connections with uh, with a winery that uh, is from Spain, Miguel Torres, and the mm. the last winemaker that is not now. He he can. He convinced the people of Miguel Torres to to sell me little sticks of Alvarino so I could I could start reproducing these grapes. So so that that's why it's not easy because it's not like ah oh, I, I will I will go and I will buy these plants. They doesn't exist in Chile. So so that's why it's interesting and it's going to be uh, slow, but I think the results are going to be very good, very good. Well, you, you'll certainly have a, a we're, we're all ready and waiting for it, Connie, we, we can't wait to try it, but also, unfortunately, <laughs> if we need to wait, we understand, you know, all good things take, take their own time. Um, Jorge, I've got another question here from Gary Stevens. Um, why is Pinot Noir so in vogue or, or fashionable at the moment? Um, is it a cheaper grape or is it easy to work with? Oh, well, um, I think it be, it's because of the taste. I think it's because uh, uh, how well it can work with food or by itself or also the different styles that you can find. I think it's one of those grapes today that um, it kind of, it, it, you can find, as, as we talked before, uh, you can find Pinot Noir from New Zealand with character from France, of course, right? Uh, but then you have California, Chile, Argentina, uh, so many places and, and, and from different terrains, you're getting so many different wines. And I think that makes the variety more attractive at the end for, for new consumers. Uh, but, uh, but no, uh, it's actually very difficult to work in my, in my opinion. Uh, the, the harvest window is very small. Uh, the vineyard is actually um, difficult to take care of. Uh, the, the berries can get uh, dehydration very fast. Uh, you have to be very careful with, with pruning, with everything that you do. And then fermentation is also uh, not that easy. I, I think you have to be very careful with the aromas and reduction. And I think it's a delicate wine at the end. So, um, and, and it's not cheap also. I, most uh, Pinot Noir grapes are, are difficult to harvest. You don't also get that much yield. Uh, so I think it's more about that you love uh, Pinot Noir and you want to make it and you just make it happen. But uh, no, I don't think it's easy to work with. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, we but it's were fun. Rod, yeah, we, we were with Rod Eastope, um on Wednesday night um, on one of these sessions and we, he might have been asked the same question and he said it, it's a bit of a, a crazy pursuit trying to make yeah. you know Pinot Noir. But you know when you get it right, it's just spectacular um, yeah. but so many places it's so hard to to, to get right but um Jorge, i think you, you've done a great job with this I, I love it and i can't wait for people to to try it as well um, cool. connie connie um so normally we go on tour we meet all the angels and winemakers and it's it's it's, it's awesome 
and we can't do it this year unfortunately for for understandable reasons yeah. Um, what 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 are your favorite wines when you normally are on tours? We've talked about Alvarino already, and um, you know that that being an inspiration for one of your latest crazy projects. What other what other naked wines would be your favorites in in the room? Absolutely, I I you know before when before that angels get into the, the tasting room we are all having a great time tasting together the the wines of each other and i'm talking about the wines and exploring new flavors uh, i i really love um to taste the the old uh, world spain france they have uh, italy they have more varieties than we have I think um, I, of course, I say New Zealand, Australia, uh, I, I like the wines, but they're uh, a little bit more like in our position, it's like a bit the same. But when I go to France, when I go to Katie's table or to Ben Darno, and I can try Languedoc wine and uh, grapes that we don't have here, like uh, I discovered in, in the tours, the Grenache, And, and then I start thinking, why we don't have these grapes in Chile? It's the uh, weather is quite similar. It would be so nice if we have uh, red Grenache. Why we don't have these white varieties? And I and I really enjoy tasting those wines, like the Spanish grapes. We have a little bit of Tempranillo here, but not too much. And Alvariño is amazing. Verdejo, um, all those grapes, I love them. I really have a lot of fun going especially to, to Spain with Carlos and France, especially Languedoc that I really love. For me, Burgundy is a little bit more, more known because I've been uh, more times there. Hmm. But Lang Languedoc, Roussillon, all, all that area, I think it's fantastic wines. I really love them. Hmm. Yeah, to totally agree with you. The, the wines are great, the people are great, and yeah, that was great. Yeah. that's awesome. Yeah. Lagarde of Katie, the, the, she has a, a blend that is um, Grenache Blanc and Grenache Gris, and the flavors are so different to Sauvignon Blanc or Chardonnay. Hmm. I love that. Me and Mr. Jones wines also. Yeah, we were drinking nice. them last night. Ben's wines, really beautiful wines. Hmm. Very good. Okay, guys, well, um, we're just about out of time, so that that's a wrap. Um, thank you very much for your, for joining us uh, today, tonight from from Chile, um, Jorge. It's been great to meet you. Um, your wine is uh, delicious. Um, as I say, I can't wait for uh, all the angels to try it. Uh, we're going to be putting it out on a pre order on Monday. It's only ten ninety nine, um, and like I say, for uh, Quality wise, it's right up there with a really good, you know, Santa Rita Hills, California st style Pinot. So it's and for 11 quid a bottle, that, 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 that's a total steal. So um, that, that pre-order will be going out on Monday and everyone who's signed up for this session uh, will definitely get an email about that on Monday. So look out for that. The wine will be here early next year. So very excited for, for that to happen. And um, Connie, amazing to reconnect as always. Thank you so much for, oh, it's great. for joining us. Great to see you. And um, <laughs> er everyone's so, so, so thrilled to um, have you on board and have, have Jorge on board now as well. And um, yeah, really enjoyed the chat. Uh, I'm signing it off now for the tour. It's been a great few days. Really enjoyed it. Next session, definitely hang in there. We've got a great one for you, Ray and the legendary Stephen DeVette uh, and his son, oh. Jamie, um, are our ending the tour in style. So um, you gotta, gotta hang around for that. So um, thanks everyone, uh, awesome That's session great. again. And uh, thank you all for your support and thanks Connie, thanks Jorge. We'll see you again thank soon. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. Thank you. Bye guys. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Bye.